This may be the hardest question I've tried to answer yet. Is the Sony A1 a cinema camera? Not, can it shoot nice video? Can it compete with high-end, feature film-ready cinema cameras? I feel like there have been a lot of reviews of the Sony A1 as a professional photography tool, but not as a professional cinematography instrument. A cine camera, if you can call it that. When I was buying mine, I wanted to know how it compared to a RED camera, or an ARRI, or even the Sony Venice, but those reviews just aren't out there. There are a few comparing the Sony A7S III to the RED Komodo, and that Sony shares a lot of the same features with the A1, but the A1 is also significantly different. There's the obvious 8K mode, but also subtle shifts in color science, the ever so slightly better dynamic range of the A1, an equally slight improvement in rolling shutter, differences regarding when noise starts to appear in the image, and changes in the bit depth and subsampling that occurs when you downsample from 8K to 4K, which is essentially an entirely new video quality mode in the A1, and one that eliminates the moray you see in both Sonys in 4K. On the surface, 8K might seem a little gimmicky, but when you move into the upper escalon of cinema cameras, you begin to see its value. And at that level, the difference between a RED and an ARRI and a Venice and a top-end mirrorless camera is also fairly nuanced. Those cameras are chosen for the big-budget feature films, but can this one do the job as well? I wanted to see a head-to-head -head comparison of the A1 and the ARRI Alexa Mini LF, and this is not it. I don't own any of those cameras. I'm hoping this inspires someone who does to do that comparison. I'm going to do a very deep dive into the Sony A1 as a cinematography camera in three parts. First, how does it stack up against the RED Kimono and the ARRI Alexa Mini LF in terms of features and capability? Second, I'll do a real-world comparison of the A1 with the Zcam E2, which is a cinema camera that I do happen to own. And third, my personal opinion of the A1 for cinematography after seven months of use. This review is long, but it is packed. In bygone days, you bought computers by manufacturers. You bought an IBM or a Dell or an Apple, and there were just a couple of choices. But roughly a decade later, you started to hear the phrase, parts is parts. Simply put, the tech is the sum of its parts. 4K has the same resolution and thus basically the same sharpness across cameras. 10-bit collects the same amount of color data. Yes, color science varies. I'm a Sony shooter, so I know that better than anyone. But there's a lot to be gained by just comparing the parts, or in this case, the specs of different cameras to see if the A1 is worthy of being included in the Escalon of top-tier cinema cameras. Now. As a caveat, specs are complicated and they often are not apples to apples, so I'm going to do a basic presentation here and then talk more about their real-world implications. If you've got an observation about the specs or experience with either of these cameras, leave a comment below, please. I'll start with the RED Kimono because RED is fairly legendary and the budget Kimono is in the same basic price range as the A1. You might choose it as your cinema camera for a documentary or an indie film. It's also Netflix approved. The Sony A1 costs $6,500 for the body alone. The Komodo is $6,000, but you'll need to buy a cage, handle, battery, cables, and monitor to bring it up to the basic usability of the Sony. If you go budget, that's at least another $500, but to match the quality of the Komodo, you're more likely to spend an extra $1,500 as a minimum. But this isn't about price, it's about quality. Do they produce cinema-level images, and how? The Sony uses a full-frame sensor. The Komodo sensor is Super 35. Smaller sensors have limitations when it comes to video, and I'll talk more about those later. The Sony A1 shoots 4K at 10-bit and 422 up to 120 frames per second, as well as 8K at 10 bits, 420 up to 30 frames per second. And externally, you can record downsampled 5.8K to 4K in 444 12-bit RAW. You can also shoot 8K downsampled to 4K externally, resulting in something of a mystery bit depth in subsampling. It's improved, but it's unclear exactly how much. One thing is clear is that even the finest details are moray-free in 8K. The Komodo shoots 6K 16-bit RAW internally, though only up to 40 frames per second, and then varying resolutions for other FPS up to 120 frames per second in 2K. RAW video is a complex subject, and it's a mistake to simply think RAW is better. RAW is still processed, meaning data has been discarded, and it's still limited to the dynamic range of your sensor, as well as the bit depth. 
Depending on your camera, you may eliminate subsampling, increase your bit depth, and gain flexibility with ISO and color temperature. More on that to follow. The Sony has a functional dynamic range of 13.8 stops in 4K, and the RED has a dynamic range of 13.6 stops. You might be surprised by that result. I was. But it's based on the thorough testing of the folks over at CineD. Thank you. The A1 has a latitude of 8 stops according to Cine D, and the Komodo has a latitude of 7 stops. Moreover, the Komodo's latitude is mostly in the underexposure portion. The camera clips out at about 2 stops over. So the Sony has slightly better dynamic range and slightly greater latitude that's also more evenly distributed for recovering images in post. But Red cameras are known for their gorgeous images and soft highlights, you say. And that's true, and true for the Komodo, as far as I can tell. What's important to remember is that the image that you see, the one that people fall in love with, is essentially a LUT. You can call it color science, and that's accurate. But color science is merely the process of assigning values to the raw data as determined by bits and resolution and dynamic range. A LUT is assigning value to most of those same parameters just a little later in the chain. You can love the image without it being directly connected to its acquisition capabilities. The Sony has a traditional shutter and the Komodo has a global shutter, which is significantly better for film. The Sony has a max ISO that is mind-boggling, though it gets noisy after about 32,000. The Komodo tops out at 12,800 ISO, but it's fairly noisy at 4,000, which is the A1 second native ISO in log, increasing the functional range even further. Physically, the Sony is considerably smaller and lighter, and an external monitor is less necessary for good handling, whereas the Komodo definitely needs a monitor and a cage for ease of use. Komodo can record in ProRes internally, which is easier for playback. The Sony has all intra, or SI, which is also easier for playback, but at the cost of bigger files. ProRes and SI are both lossy formats. Those are compressed files, just very high quality. Both cameras have autofocus, though the Sony is superior, and both have image stabilization, with again the Sony being superior. So those are the specs, and we'll talk more about them later. Now let's look at the Ari Alexa Mini LF, arguably one of the highest quality cinema cameras ever made, as of the now. Cost, Sony 6500, Mini 59000 plus another 5000 to make it usable. Sony's sensor is full frame. Ari's sensor is ever so slightly larger. Field of view and impact on depth of field, however, are basically the same, so there's no functional difference in sensor size. Resolution, 4.5K in open gate and 4K in the traditional 16x9 format. All in 12-bit Ari RAW with breathtakingly high bit rates and file sizes. Like the Sony external output, the Ari originally captures 16-bit info but records it as 12. I suspect the Komodo is doing the same thing, though I can't find a confirmation on this. The max frame rate is 90 FPS, but it's already downsampled to HD compared to the Sony's 240 at HD. Dynamic range is 14.7 stops, making it a full stop wider than the Sony, and it has a latitude of 10 stops, which is more flexible by two stops, and frankly astounding. Both cameras have a traditional shutter, with the Sony boasting excellent control in 4K at 8.1 milliseconds, and the Ari a best-in-class value of 7.4 milliseconds. Ari's ISO tops out at 3200. It's extraordinarily clean, but it's also a limitation. As the scene gets darker, you either start utilizing that excellent latitude for recovery, or you find other lighting solutions. Remember, you're exposing to the right 1.7 stops in Ari Log C, so it's essentially like shooting the ISO of 1000. I'm sure that's not going to be very clear. If your light meter says f5.6 is properly exposed at an ISO of 1000, then you set your camera to ISO 3200 to overexpose by the necessary 1.7 stops for RE log. Now that's not very good for low light situations, and it should be acknowledged that the A1 has arguably the best low light performance of any camera on the market, up to 6400 ISO, even better than the Sony A7S III. Physically, the Ari is small in comparison to its top-end peers, but much larger than the Komodo and the Sony, and the setup rigging time is several minutes. I'm just stating the obvious when I say that the Ari can produce better images than the Sony, but the nuanced part here is can 
in a Hollywood setting where you have enormous resources for shaping light and rigging, the RE excels, but it also has hard lines where the image starts to deteriorate, whether that's at ISO 4000 or FPS 90. And I have to wonder just how much more image quality and latitude the 12-bit RE RAW files produce when compared to the 8K to 4K downsampled image. I'd love to see a review of RAW versus ProRes when it comes to image latitude. We know that both images will be, let's say, roughly... The Sony is likely to be sharper from the downsampling and the RE will have a higher bit depth, making it better for extreme grading and chroma keying. Though how much higher is a mystery if you're downsampling all the way from 8K to HD, and because the practical difference between 10 and 12 bits is hard to quantify. One is internal and the other external, but you can't really claim that the external recording of the Sony is a negative without pointing out that the RE is a relative behemoth of protruding parts and functional awkwardness. The biggest difference here is the extra stop of dynamic range and those two stops of latitude. A stop is a doubling of light, so it's collecting a ton more information. But 14.7 stops is also a capability that other cinema cameras don't possess either, so the Sony is not disqualified by having only 13.8 stops. I'll talk more about what I think these specs mean in my summary, but let's do a real-world comparison of the one cinema camera I do own, the Zcam E2. The E2 doesn't have a lot of street cred as a cinema camera. It made a big splash as a budget option, and then as the field filled up with competitors, they lost a bit of their space in the cinema ecosystem, but it is a bona fide cinema camera and worth using as a comparison. The E2 has a micro four-thirds sensor, which is its biggest drawback. With a speed booster, you can open up the field of view to the equivalent of a Super 35, similar to the Komodo. Like the Sony, it shoots 4K up to 120 frames per second and HD up to 240 FPS, all in 10-bit. It can record DCI 4K and true 24 frames per second. It also records ProRes 422, and with an external recording to the Ninja 5, you can capture 12-bit RAW files. So you see why I insist that it's a cinema camera. Its dynamic range is 12 stops, and it has a max ISO of 102,400, just like the Sony, but it gets noisier much, much faster. Like the Komodo, it needs to be kitted out with a cage and power and a monitor. But the budget E2 is just $2,000, which, given its capabilities, is an excellent value. You just have to come to terms with a four-thirds sensor and to work with a lower dynamic range. I've got a full review of the camera if you want to get into the nitty gritty, but I'd say that my opinions have changed a little bit since that review two years ago. My test shots are with a Nikon 35mm f.2 lens. This isn't a great lens, but for some reason that I can't remember, I own two of them. So while the color, contrast, and sharpness could be better, they are at least identical for both cameras. This is the Z-Cam with a very high dynamic range scene. By itself, it looks pretty respectable because the Z-Log has done a good job of keeping the sky and the shadows within range. There's neither clipping nor crushing. But when compared to the Sony, it doesn't possess the color information in the blue sky and the shrubs are fairly lifeless. This, I think, is the loss of those two stops of dynamic range. When we look at a shot that's not quite so extreme in terms of range, the image suddenly becomes very close in quality. The Z-Cam tends to have some yellow in its green, which is harder to pull out. Here is a more colorful example, and you start to see how beautiful the Z-Cam footage can be when not pushed too far. The Sony is 8K internal. Moving to some indoor shots, here we have the Rec. 709 version of both cameras. They're fairly similar, with the Z-Cam having more yellow in the green here as before, and the Sony having more orange in the red. I've adjusted the exposure and black points, but no other color grading. When you look at the log footage from each camera, in this controlled situation, the Z-Cam looks quite similar to the Sony. The Z-Cam is graded by LUT and the Sony by Transform. When you look at the Z-Cam Rec. 709 versus the Z-Log 2, you can see that the Z-Cam struggles a bit to stay in the same color space as its own 709 footage. The Sony Rec. and Slog colors, however, appear much closer in the studio setting. On most every front, the Sony equaled or outperformed the E2 in my tests. They both have impressive color science and create beautiful images, especially when in the Rec. 709 mode. Where you might prefer the Z-Cam is with internal ProRes recording. 
but in terms of the image fidelity, flexibility, ease of use, the A1 is one step ahead. Shooting log in a Z cam was frustrating because you only have the histogram as a guide. The Sony has the EV scale as well. Overall, the Sony A1 was much easier to work with in the field, from handling to setting exposure levels to having a viewfinder to see what I'm doing. I'm going to digress a moment to talk about why I believe a larger sensor is better. There's a misconception that a speed booster increases the speed of the lens, pumping it from an f1.8 to an f1.2 or some other faster speed. This is incorrect. Here we have a 50 millimeter on a full frame that's been cropped to a Super 35, and a 35 millimeter on an MFT with a booster, increasing the field of view so that the cameras roughly match each other. Both are set to f2.8, and as you can see, there's roughly the same amount of bokeh in each. The booster hasn't created a shallower depth of field compared to the full frame. But even though the angle of view is the same, the booster hasn't compressed the visual image to that of a 50 millimeter. The image from the MFT makes the background appear farther away, less compressed, which is what wide angle lenses do. Which means that faces will distort as they do on wide angle lenses, and the defects of the wide angle lens such as barreling are now appearing in your nifty 50. These are the reasons that I dislike MFTs and found that the E2, which creates beautiful images, a bit discouraging, at least as my main camera. It's also why I believe the full frame of the Sony is superior to the Super 35 of the Komodo. The differences aren't as dramatic, but we've been talking about nuances this entire time. Having a full frame sensor already moves the Sony into competition with higher level cinema cameras like the Red Raptor and the Ari LF series. Only top of the line Ari's in fact have sensors that are full frame or larger. So let's talk a little bit more about the Sony by itself. After seven months of using it primarily as my video camera, I'll say that the A1 is a joy to use. I love how much of the functionality is right at my fingertips. I can access so many tools without entering the menu system. I can understand how some cinematographers might hate the tiny form factor being used to a larger camera, but in most situations, it just plays to your advantage, fitting into smaller spaces, requiring less to rig, being easier to transport and less conspicuous in public. The 8K footage is jaw-droppingly detailed and sharp. Let's just leave it at that. The color quality of the indoor scenes is excellent, and unless I'm shooting a scene with wide dynamic range, I often just shoot in S Cinetone. It requires very little grading. S-Log3, however, is a workhorse. In most situations, it grades nicely, and it is easy to match the excellent color quality of S Cinetone. When pushed with high dynamic scenes, in particular ones with a lot of complex textures, the image can feel a little brittle when corrected. For best results, I definitely made use of the Luma versus Saturation. It was my best friend. The darker, lower luminosity areas tend to oversaturate, and the skies appear undersaturated, which is why this tool is so handy for targeting adjustments. Color Transform was too crude a tool for these scenes, and it was best to start grading from scratch. In 10-bit, I never once ran into issues of banding. I went back and forth about whether I preferred the H.265 footage or the ProRes 422. They're slightly different. The ProRes has slightly more contrast in S-Log3, which at times gave it a more pleasing look to the grade, but technically it's the opposite of what you want Log to do or be. Ultimately, I felt the 8K image was superior to the 4K ProRes 422. It added sharpness without compromising color. The S-Log3 footage at the native ISO of 800 is remarkably clean when exposed correctly. If you zoom into 200%, there's zero detectable noise in 4K on a 4K screen. At 600%, it's still very, very clean, hardly any noise in the shadows. At the second base ISO of 4000, the image is still quite clean. It's only when you zoom into 200% that you notice movement in the shadows. At 600%, the noise is noticeable and distracting, but that's zoomed beyond what the pixels themselves can stand. Noise reduction helps some, but it doesn't eliminate the problem. The best advice I can offer for working in S-Log3 is to shoot at ISO 800 and overexpose by 1.7 stops. Here I am standing under the shadow of a tree with the background in full sun, and I exposed for me. With color correction and a modest amount of grading, I was able to find an excellent balance. When pushed, the S-Log3 footage does skew slightly orange in the red, especially with the color transform LUT, and I desaturated my skin to reduce that effect. 
And it should be noted that in film production, you don't just head out at noon and shoot wherever. You plan for a better location, a better time of day, you bring in a negative fill or a bounce, and you frame it so there's not bright chaos behind your subject. So this image and most of the other exteriors that I've used for my tests aren't quite fair. With the most difficult dynamic range scenes, I'll admit I didn't love the image of the Sony. It wasn't bad, it just felt rather technical, for lack of a better term. I was just color correcting, not grading, which might explain my reaction. But I also noticed that at times an area wasn't clipped in the scopes, but it was essentially clipped on screen. I couldn't recover any additional information. I'm not sure why that is. I've been slow to adopt 8K into my shooting routine, but it has clear advantages for high-end cinematography. Yes, there's more detail, but when you downsample, you also increase your bit depth and subsampling. What's more, you shrink the noise to something that's more pleasing, and Moray disappears completely in 8K. For products designed for the internet, whether that's YouTube or a corporate video, those benefits are negligible. But when shooting for a larger screen, those improvements can move beyond gimmick to features of significant value. You can also dual record 8 and 4K simultaneously. That dual recording option provides a level of confidence that some creators will appreciate. The A1 also shoots 240 frames per second in HD, and the quality here is quite good. With software today, you can slow that down to 5% speed or upsample it to an approximate 4K image, so there's really no reason to complain that the A1 is only HD or only 240 frames per second. Let's talk about RAW. Some cinematographers will insist that shooting RAW is always the best choice, and having a camera that does that internally is an advantage. But there are some disadvantages to RAW that should be considered from a practical standpoint. RAW video is noisier, and for some cameras, this cuts into their sharpness and their latitude for underexposed images. That noise is often invisible until you push the grade in post, which is one of the reasons that you choose RAW to begin with, for more latitude in grading. You also don't get lens corrections, there are no high frame rates in the RAW world, and no active stabilization if your camera offers that. It can be more difficult to judge exposure, which translates into being more time consuming on set. And nailing log exposure is harder to do in the real world with complex backgrounds and moving subjects. And of course, the visual advantages of RAW are generally limited to color. RAW doesn't have more physical detail or more dynamic range, just more color information. RAW does offer you the ability to change your ISO and color temperatures in post, and to be selective about noise reduction and sharpening. Those capabilities aren't quite as straightforward as they sound, and they deserve their own video to unpack. For my tests, I used Assimilate Play Pro to convert my RAW footage into ProRes 444XQ, something DaVinci Resolve can read. In the studio shots, the RAW image exposes more like the internal H.265 than the external ProRes 422 footage. As expected, it's not as sharp, and while at first glance it doesn't appear any noisier, the noise explodes as the grading becomes more intense. Being 12-bit, one would expect it to handle grading with fewer artifacts? It didn't. I exposed correctly for this scene, then color graded it, and then set the saturation to 200%. Clearly an extreme situation. When you punch in, you can see that the noise is pretty ugly on the H.265 footage, but the noise fairly destroys the image in RAW. After applying noise reduction and sharpening to restore some detail, the image improves. But I still found it worse than the internal 4K H.265. The raw image still has more fringing, and eliminating that destroyed the detail in a way that couldn't be retrieved with sharpening. So let's take a look at raw in a more normal situation. Here is a very high dynamic range scene, from white clouds to shadowed forest. This is the 8K 10-bit 420 footage, and frankly, it looks great on a 4K screen. Here is the ProRes 10-bit 422 footage of the same scene. There's a slight change in the mid-range exposures, but they're nearly identical. And here is the RAW 444 version. It looks identical to the H.265 on the wide shot. It's impossible to tell which footage is which. If you punch in, you can see that the 8K footage has more detail than the RAW. But frankly, in this image, the RAW is plenty sharp. There's no other difference between 12-bit 444 RAW and 10-bit 420 8K in this footage. 
until you punch into the shadows underneath the tree. There's more green in the shadow side of the tree. Here, finally, we see the benefit of the raw file. We're punched in 600%, but if the scene had more of these shadows, we wouldn't be. And the color information in the raw file would make the image appear more natural. Of course, these shadows are as dark as they are because we had to expose for the blue sky and clouds. It's a pretty extreme exposure scenario. And the raw file comes at a big cost in terms of storage. This 50 second raw file started at 8.5 gigabytes. After being converted to ProRes XQ, it ballooned to 12.5 gigabytes. But the 8K file is just 2.5. If you're a Final Cut user, you can work with the original RAW file, but it's still nearly four times larger than the 8K. And in truth, I could not find this increased color information in any of the other RAW footage, despite pixel peeping at shadows at 600%. This may be because the downsampled 8K footage at 10-bit 420 becomes something very much like 12-bit 422 in terms of color information. These clips have the exact same color grade, by the way. The raw file is grading exactly the same as the H.265 due to the S-Log3. The magic of RAW is largely about the amount of invisible data available to you if you need it. It doesn't roll off your highlights or expand your dynamic range. It may become helpful if you're shooting green screen or day for night where every ounce of colored data might possibly, in circumstances, be called into play and you will find more color in dark shadows and possibly in the high highlights. But for the most part, and in most situations, your gorgeous image is created before you reach 12 bits or 444. I would have loved it if the raw file had been much better than the internal codec. I mean, it's the main reason I shelled out 500 bucks for a Ninja 5. But in truth, I found that the 8K to 4K downsampled image to be the most visually pleasing and equally resilient in post. In a specific scene, such as a very shadowy drama or when faced with color temperature questions I can't answer on set, I might pick RAW over 8K. But for a DaVinci Resolve user where you have to convert the footage to a ProRes 444 file, the RAW file is a bit insane. The conversion is slow and you end up with two massive files, a combined 23 gigabytes per minute of footage. And you need to keep both files because only the RAW file is, of course, raw. The ProRes XQ has the color information baked into it. But for this question, is the A1 a competent cinema camera? You do have raw, you have the extra color information, and the fact that it's recorded externally doesn't really matter. Despite cinematographers' love of RAW, and despite Ari and Red and Apple and Atomos dearly wanting you to believe in the supremacy of RAW, there is another dynamic at play here. RAW came into being in 2006, at a time when digital video was still largely HD and the concept of 10 bits was unheard of. RAW video was developed for professional filmmakers and the quality was mind-blowing, but in the 16 years that followed, other codecs have been introduced and compression techniques have been improved, and the distance between RAW quality and processed video has gotten less and less. So much so that Ari will say that ProRes 444 is, and I quote, almost indistinguishable from uncompressed UHD material. And Apple will say that ProRes XQ444 is virtually indistinguishable from HQ422. Does this mean that Ari RAW is virtually indistinguishable from HQ422 video? Well, basically, yes, Ari and Apple just said so. But why? 12-bit RAW has four times more information than 10-bit. There's got to be something there. The answer to my surprise is log. Charles Poynton and others will tell you that you can fit 99% of 12-bit RAW file data into a 10-bit log file. This is so different from my understanding of RAW and 12-bit that it kind of made my head hurt. In the right circumstance, or maybe just the right set of problems, RAW is slightly better. But it's also slightly worse in some situations, and it's difficult to tell which circumstance you're in until you've already shot the footage. Now, one of the surprising features about the A1 is that you don't have to choose. You can shoot RAW externally and H.265 internally in 4K. This, unfortunately, does not extend to 8K. But if you're anxious about your post-processing challenges, you can shoot both RAW and processed video at the same time with the A1. That's next level proxy work. I'm going to dive deeper into RAW ProRes H.265 comparison to see how they hold up in various situations and to see if my conclusions here hold true in the next video. So hit the subscribe button if you haven't already.
The A1 is missing a few features that are generally found in cinema cameras, and some might feel that this disqualifies it from the category. These include DCI aspect ratios, no true 24p, no internal ND filter, and some time code issues. These are worth considering and unpacking. Using the DCI aspect ratio as a defining characteristic of a cinema camera has some validity. After all, the vast majority of theatrical releases will use those extra pixels on the widescreen. But given the ability to shoot in 8K means even more pixels, it's hard to disqualify any 8K or even 6K camera on the basis of not shooting DCI dimensions. You can export to DCI. Today, you can argue that the A1 does better than 4K DCI. 24p is another sticking point for purists, but less so for actual cinematographers. In the US and most everywhere else, films are shot in 23.976. This is because 24p has to be converted to that lower frame rate for sound editing. It then either stays there for release to DVD, the internet, or television, or is reconverted back to 24 for theatrical release and Blu-ray. Every film will be converted to 23.976 if shot in 24p, so there's no point in starting out at 24 frames per second. No internal ND filter is a, also a valid complaint, though a bit comic considering that cinema cameras in general require so many other components in order to function. Their one convenience, an internal ND filter. Woohoo! The red kimono, incidentally, doesn't have internal ND and neither does the E2. So it's not common to all cinema cameras. But timecode is an issue that can have a real impact for a feature filmmaker. The A1 does have internal timecode, but it doesn't have a dedicated input for syncing with audio or other cameras. Granted, there are numerous workarounds. You can sync multiple Sony cameras with any Sony remote. You can jam timecode into one of your audio channels with a device like Tentacle Sync. But what's missing is a way to record external timecode information that's not on the audio file itself. It's a rather specific problem because you can accomplish any other timecode task. It's just either incomplete or an inelegant solution. Though to be fair, I'm not a timecode person and I don't work on productions that ask for more than the simplest of syncs. But my impression is, is that you don't get a simple elegant solution on the RED or ARRI cameras either. So I don't know where to put this complaint exactly. The A1 also has some advantages over other top of the line cinema cameras that we've already talked about. These include better low light performance and higher frame rates for slow motion. It can shoot multiple formats simultaneously. It strips down smaller and lighter and can travel almost incognito. And because of these characteristics, it's able to accomplish a wider range of cinematic expression than an ARRI or RED camera. There, I said it. My biggest gripe is the histogram. It's the type designed for photography, not professional video. You can't read it correctly, and thus it becomes a very blunt tool. There are plenty of devices, including your phone, that you can use to get a proper histogram, but come on. I mean, Sony could, I suspect, correct this in firmware, but will they? <laughs> So when it comes to image quality, what's my takeaway? Could you use the A1 as a A cam for a feature film? This review has redefined my sense of what constitutes a cinema camera, what specs it needs. Most important on that list now is dynamic range above 13 stops. This is followed by latitude of at least seven stops, bit depth with a minimum of 10 and a sweet spot of 12, subsampling a minimum of 422, and that's it. Sure, you need good color science as a base, otherwise you're fighting the image the whole way and destroying your latitude and dynamic range and color correction. But everything else about the camera, powering options, audio, raw files, form factor, is really frosting. To give you a sense of just where the A1 stands with my new criteria, here is the dynamic range and latitude for a few other cameras. I stuck to those that Cine D evaluated to make the tests consistent, so I'm sure I'm missing some of your favorites. Here is the Sony A1, and here is some of the competition. As you can see, the Sony A1 stays ahead of its mirrorless competition in even accepted cine cameras like the Canon C500 Mark II, the Ursa Mini Pro, and the FX9 before getting, uh, let's face it, fairly walloped by the Ari Alexa line. The C500, incidentally, was used on Jason Bourne, Fathers and Daughters, The Big Short, The Avengers, Age of Ultron, and other movies. It may be heretical to say this, but given the specs, the A1 may be positioned as the best B-cam to the Sony Venice and the Sony lineup. 
If you look at the promotional materials for the FX9, it's touting all of the same features that the A1 has as well. If anyone has both the A1 and the FX9 or the Venice, I'd love to see that comparison. People may argue that despite the technical similarities of the specs, the RED and the RE both look better. It's hard to fault that. That look is really a LUT that has been custom designed to fit the sensor, dynamic range, and color science. In some respects, that's different than the camera producing a better image. And as beautiful as it is, it's often crushed out of existence by LUTs and grading. If you take a movie like The Joker, which was nominated for an Oscar in cinematography, it was shot on several Ari Alexas, but it doesn't have that Ari look because it's been graded into submission. Graded not just beyond 10 or 12 bits, but beyond anything that is characteristically Ari. There are a few brief moments where the beautiful dynamic range of the Ari pushes through, but for the most part, the colors are intentionally putrid and the look is defined by the lenses, not the camera. So did it need to be shot on an Ari at all? Was it $52,000 poorly spent? The A1 will never be the A camera in a Hollywood blockbuster for a variety of reasons. The cost of an Ari is minuscule when it comes to the total budget of a Hollywood film, literally a penny to the dollar. So why not go with the very best that money can buy? The lack of internal time code adds challenges to the process and I think that some cinematographers are a little afraid to use the A1 because they're unfamiliar with just where and when the image reaches its limit. But the lack of prestige, the Ari or Red name, is the nail that seals its coffin here. No one will ever challenge your camera judgment if you pick an Ari or a Red. The real question seems to be less, could you ever use it? But more, would you ever?